Good morning. Today, the plan is to finish up talking about electronic spectroscopy and to start go, moving toward talking about NMR. So we're going to have a little detour where uh, we look at Fourier transforms and talk about crystallography really briefly, just because it's neat and it ties into a lot of other things that we've, that we've been doing. It uses Fourier transforms. It involves interactions between photons and, and matter. It's not spectroscopy. We're going to talk about it not in any great depth, but it's neat. It involves symmetry. Um, does anybody have any questions about electronic spectroscopy or anything from last time? Yes. It's hard to hear me. OK, let me see if I can fix that. Is that better? All right, good. Any other questions about electronic spectroscopy or Frank Condon factors or anything like that? OK, good. Everybody's ready to take the quiz. Um, get out a piece of paper. <laughs> I, Come on, you walked into that. I, I would be happy to stand here asking, answering questions uh, as much as you want. But uh, you, you said you're ready to take the quiz, so, so here it is. Your lowest quiz is going to be dropped anyway, no matter what. And then the way the, the way the seminars work is you get points if you answer the questions. I've been giving five points for answering the questions. You have to answer every question and write a reasonable amount for each thing to, uh, to get all the points. So the seminars are, in general, worth a little more than the average quiz. And how it works is they just get averaged in with your quiz grade. So you can go to as many as you want, as long as they're the actual PCHEM seminars or things that, that I've approved as, as being related to PCHEM. And there's no limit. So, you know, I'm sure this would never happen, but if you mess up the quiz every time and you go to a lot of seminars, you can pretty much make it go away. Um, not, that, uh, not that anyone is worried about that today. Um, so let's talk about this a little bit. So it's, uh, it's not actually that difficult, but I think it's a little tricky because it's maybe worded in a different way than you're used to seeing it, or you have to pull, a lot, pull together a lot of stuff from, that you've learned from different places in the class. And that is kind of hard. So that's, um, that's one of the things that I'd really like you to get out of it. So one of the problems with, with PCHEM, at least starting out, is that a lot of the things that, that people actually do in our research labs is so involved computationally that we can't really do a realistic example in class. <clears throat> and so what I'd like you to get out of it is an understanding of how we sort of work through these problems, you know, what the concepts are the cases where symmetry helps us and to really understand the fundamentals of some basic problems. And then, you know, if you become a physical chemist and you do electronic spectroscopy on more complicated molecules, then you could learn all the tools that you need to, to understand these things computationally. Okay, so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this, but I just want to uh, briefly talk about how to do it. Okay, so for the first one, is an electronic transition from a sigma plus state to a sigma minus state induced by Z polarized radiation allowed in HCl? OK, so what do you need to know here? You need to remember that HCl belongs to the C infinity V point group, which hopefully everyone figured out from having the uh, point group table there, if nothing else. Um, the other important thing about this question is that if you just remembered Laporte's rule, you got the wrong answer because that only works for environments where there's an inversion center. And of course, HCl doesn't have an inversion center. So how you actually do this is you take your character table and look at the symmetries for the, rel the relevant species. So sigma plus is A1. We have a Z for the dipole moment operator in the Z direction. That's also A1. And then sigma minus is A2. And you multiply the coefficients for those things together. And of course, what you end up with belongs to the A2 symmetry species, which is not A1. And so you can say the transition is not allowed. So that's how you do that. So again, 
it's really easy if you remember how to do it, and if you don't, it's confusing. So, you know what what I what I want the take-home message is the what I want the take-home message to be is just you know think about the problem and the information that you're given, and you know figure out how to do it. Yes. I know this makes sense, but can we also say that because there is no uh, X and Z component in the sigma minus, uh, because when we have uh, Z polarized, we only care about the X and Y, right? Um, no, so so Z polarized radiation is telling us that you know it's only along Z. So so that's. The idea is, is kind of there, but, but the, you got confused about the details. OK, um, yes? Um, do you like transition from plus to minus is forbidden, but in what case, right? So we, we talked about various specific cases. Um, you know, as far as getting credit, if you get the right answer and you wrote some reasonable rationale, you get the right answer. But I guess what I worry about on exams is that if you get the wrong answer but you had a reasonable thought process, please make sure you write down enough that, so that we can give you partial credit. Okay, so that's the first one. The second one, basically, I just wanted you to draw a potential diagram for these electronic states. I said it only has two to make it relatively simple. And the business about the upper state being shifted in the x direction by you know, 1.5 times the equilibrium bond distance is just to show that the upper state is you know, shifted over in the x direction as far as where its minimum is. And so if you drew something that looks kind of like that and you know, drew in some vibrational uh, energy levels, then that's good. Um, it's useful to be able to visualize these things. And then for the expression for the amplitude of the transition, basically what you need to do is recognize there that the electronic part of it doesn't really enter in. We're talking about the Frank Condon factor between these vibrational states. So new double prime equals zero means that this first Hermite polynomial represents your initial state. And then um, new prime equals three. So your final state is represented by this other Hermite polynomial. And then you have to stick the X operator in between them because that's your, that's your dipole moment operator. And integrate that with respect to DX and that's your, uh, that's your transition dipole, and then the Frank Condon factor is related to that squared. So that's uh, basically what you do. Yes? It's, um, it's the whole wave function, but for this example, it's, it's uh, related to these Hermite polynomials. So anyway, you didn't need to evaluate it. That wasn't part of the issue. I just wanted to write it down. Yes? Isn't it, so isn't it proportional to overlap in two states? So if you just put that in, that be sufficient? If you put that it's proportional to the overlap of the two states, that is also fine, yeah. OK, so, um, well, that's annoying. OK, technical difficulties. All right, let's finish up our discussion of electronic spectroscopy. All right, so term symbols are uh, necessary for describing the states of these molecules. And I just want to talk about this in a little bit more detail for diatomic molecules, because I think some people are confused about it. I think everyone gets the atomic from last quarter, I th the people I've talked to seem to have a really good handle on that. Um, but I think for where this comes from for diatomic molecules is a little bit confusing. And at this point, like for 
I don't want to spend a lot of time learning how to generate these for complex molecules. Let's just worry about the diatomic case. And mostly, I want you to understand what they mean. So if we have our diatomic molecule, we have uh, values of L and S for the whole thing. And our term symbol looks like this. So we've got the, the superscript is the spin multiplicity, which is 2s plus 1. And here, s is the total spin quantum number for the molecule. So to get, you know, to get this, we have to sum over all the electrons in the molecule. And then this thing, which is going to be sigma, pi, delta, et cetera, just like it's SPD for the um, atomic case, that just tells you about uh, the value of lambda for the molecule. Again, summed over all electrons. And then this thing, the subscript, which was J in the atomic case, here it's called omega. And same thing, you're adding up the, um, the Z projections of L and S. And here's a little diagram of that for the molecule. I also posted a PDF of a tutorial on this stuff that I found online um, that I think might be helpful. So you can check that out if you, if you want to or if you still feel like you need a review of this stuff. OK, so and again, just terminology. In, in this uh, particular thing, sigma is the projection of S on the internuclear axis. So same thing as, what, as when we were talking about in the atomic case, we had like the total angular momentum and the Z component of the angular momentum. Here we're projecting everything on the internuclear axis, but the idea is the same. So that's where these things are coming from and what they're about. OK, so let's look at some specific examples of how to build this up. So if we have our uh, general chemistry level uh, molecular orbital diagram, we start with some p orbitals. And here we're going to define z as the internuclear axis and say this is what we get when our, when our uh, pz orbitals overlap. So we know that we get two molecular orbitals. We get a bonding and an antibonding orbital. And now we know uh, that we can describe these as having G and U symmetry based on whether they're even or odd with respect to inversion. And since we started out with the total value of M sub L equals 0 and added that up, that's going to give us sigma terms. So we're going to get sigma orbitals out of this. And for sigma terms, we have an additional symmetry descriptor that we need to worry about. So G and U refer to what happens when you go through an inversion. Does it change sign or stay the same? And then we also have plus and minus. And plus and minus refers to what happens when you reflect through a plane containing the internuclear axis. So here's a picture of that. So that is going to be a sigma minus term, because when you reflect through that plane, it changes sign, whereas Something that looks like this, this bonding molecular orbital, that's going to be sigma plus because it stays the same when you reflect it through that plane. So those are the symmetry descriptors for sigma terms. When we get into things that have um, larger values of lambda, then some of these things disappear. So we don't have the, the plus and minus uh, descriptor anymore. but we can still write term symbols for these things. So now let's say we have px or py orbitals. And they're going to be the same. So we can just look at either px or py. Same thing. These can overlap constructively or destructively. We started with two atomic orbitals, so we need to get two molecular orbitals at the end. And we get a pi and pi star molecular orbital. But now we have m sub l being plus or minus 1 for the px and py orbitals. And again, we can describe our pi and pi star molecular orbitals as having g or u symmetry with respect to inversion. And these things uh, give us pi terms. And we need to sum over all electrons to 
to get that. And it's plus or minus one. So hopefully that helps seeing some concrete examples as to what these things mean. Um, let's talk about Frank Condon factors a little bit more. So we have looked at this mathematically, and we've seen how to write down expressions for them. Let's just look at some pictures and see what that looks like graphically. So basically, if we have um, the bonding character of two states being pretty similar, so in this case, both of these wave functions look like there's a lot of uh, electron density between the atoms. They're, they have a lot of bonding character. In that case, the, there's going to be a lot of overlap right at the point where the internuclear separation is at the equilibrium distance. And we're not going to see a lot of uh, different vibrational lines going on there because there's no reason for the nuclei to, to change position very much as a result of the electrons <coughs> popping up to that excited state. So remember, we said the, the mechanism for that is that the electrons change state, and then suddenly the nuclei are feeling all kinds of different uh, electronic potentials than they were before because the electron cloud has changed shape, and then they start to move around, and we see these, these uh, vibrational progressions. If the states were pretty similar in bonding character to begin with, then there's not very much change, and we don't see a whole bunch of lines in the spectrum. Whereas if the bonding character of the two states is really different, so in this case, we've got the electronic ground state. It you know, doesn't have a node in the middle of it. And then it hops up to this excited state where there's a lot of nodes. It, uh, does, not have a very, it does not have very much uh, bonding character in the middle of the molecule. That causes a big change in the shape of the electron cloud. And so we see this progression that has a lot of peaks in it. And also, the potential is shifted in the x direction relative to the, the ground state. OK, so we can also look at these things and learn something about dissociation energies. So in some cases, we can estimate this really directly. So again, G of nu is the, uh, the energy of this electronic transition expressed in wave numbers. And nu is the, is the uh, quantum number here. So we can write this down in terms of the, the frequency of the transition. And you know, x is the correction to the, the potential for a Morse oscillator, which I know we did some, some practice problems like that in the homework. And so we can look at what happens at nu max. So when, when nu is, is maximized here, that means we're at the dissociation limit. And so if we maximize this and, and uh, look at what happens when it equals 0, that gives us an expression for nu max. And the value for the energy of the transition when that condition is satisfied tells us about the dissociation energy. And so sometimes you can do that. You can estimate it directly. Another thing you can do is um, use something like the burge sponer plot, which we talked about a little bit. There were some practice problems on that. That's um, where you plot that frequency versus the separation. and take the, uh, you know, formally you should take the area under it. A lot of times you have to extrapolate because you don't see lines going all the way up to the, the dissociation limit here. So these are the, the kinds of things that we can get out of electronic spectra. But a lot of what they're actually used for in practical applications are more like things that we saw earlier on when when I talked about just some applications. So a big 
thing that is done with electronic spectroscopy is just Beer's law, just looking at, okay, how, I, have, I have some substance that absorbs light and I want to know the concentration of it, and you just use Beer's law to figure out uh, how much of it you have. That's a very common application of electronic spectroscopy. Um, of course, there are a lot of uh, other uses involving learning something about the molecule, as we've been talking about here. And an important branch of physical chemistry research is taking these kinds of electronic spectra and using that to find out about the bonding energy of molecules, what kind of bonding is being formed, what do some of these excited states look like. And of course, that feeds into a lot of things like in synthetic chemistry, learning about how the symmetry of different excited states affects what kinds of molecules you can make. And before we finish this off, I want to talk about one more application. So, so far we've mostly been talking about electronic spectroscopy in the UV invisible range. So that has to do with valence electrons being promoted. They're relatively low energy transitions as these things go. Of course, they're higher energy than the vibrational and rotational transitions, but we're mostly talking about valence electrons jumping up and down. If we want to learn more about the, the bonding structure of the, the molecule or, or atom, we can do photoelectron spectroscopy. And so what we're doing here is it's a, a brute force approach. So instead of sweeping the frequency and looking at where things absorb or emit, we are just bombarding the sample with high energy photons at a fixed wavelength. This is, this is often in the X-ray. So the idea is we have plenty of energy available to ionize all kinds of electrons, even deep within the, the core of the, the molecule. And then we can measure the kinetic energy of the electrons that are detected. And here's a schematic of how that works. So we have a beam of, uh, here it's shown as, as atoms, could be molecules, depends on what you're trying to measure. And that is being blasted with high energy photons. So again, a lot of times this is x-rays, it's done at synchrotrons pretty often. And then the electrons get ejected out and they are placed in an electric field and so they, they bend, so the faster ones are over here, the slower ones are over there. And so you can measure the kinetic energy of the electrons that, uh, that come out of the sample. And that tells us something about the bonding energy, because of course the amount of energy that it takes to dissociate those electrons is related to the, the energy of that bond. And so that can teach us about the bonding structure. So here are some typical values. So this is our energy in megajoules per mole. So it takes a lot of energy to, to knock these things off. And you know, as we get you know, as we get into you know, for so if, if we look at boron here, the valence electrons are relatively easy to knock off, and then it starts to get a little bit harder. But then when we get down to that 1s shell, it takes a lot of energy to to ionize these electrons. So it's as you'd expect, the electrons that are closest to the nucleus are most tightly bound, but we do have plenty of energy to ionize all of them. And so when you do this and look at all the peaks that you get, it tells you something about the, the bonding in, in the, or the, it tells you something about the uh, electronic structure of the atom or molecule. Okay, so in this case where we're just looking at atoms, you might think it's really boring because surely somebody has measured all of the, uh, you know, the ionization energies for different uh, electronic states in common atoms. And that's true, but you can use that to your advantage. So one of the, the primary uses for X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy is looking at a surface and figuring out what kinds of atoms are on that surface. So since these things are well known, there are tables of what these energies look like, you can find you know, really low levels of different kinds of things on a surface and, and learn about uh, you know, what that looks like. 
You can also do this for molecules. So here's one for N2. So again, here's our general chemistry molecular orbital level di molecular orbital diagram for uh, N2, which is a reasonable description of the bonding. Okay, so as we saw before when we were kind of uh, talking about this in a theoretical sense, you know, so here there are three bands in in the spectrum. So A is what we get when we remove a uh, a weakly bonding electron, so that's the 2p sigma g orbital. And that transition has relatively few lines, so ionizing that, uh, you know, it tells us that hopping up from the, from the ground state to that state doesn't change the internuclear separation very much. Whereas B here is uh, removing a strongly bonding electron, that's the, the pi u, it's from the pi u molecular orbital. So that's, uh, that's down here. That requires a lot more deviation in the internuclear distance. And so we see a bunch more vibrational lines. And then C comes from removing a weakly antibonding electron. And uh, you know, here we have a weaker transition and we only see one peak, so it's a, it's a relatively short progression. So just to give you an idea of uh, how these things work and how that's used. Okay, so we don't have a lot of time left, but I do want to start talking about X-ray crystallography a little bit, and we'll finish that part up next time. So just to give you an idea of where we're going with this, there's a whole chapter on solids. It contains a bunch of stuff about crystallography. I think it's chapter nine. We mostly skipped it. It might be useful to go and, and skim that and have a review of things like the difference between crystalline and amorphous solids. So you know, if something is in a crystal, it's in a really regular repeating lattice. If it's amorphous, it's still a solid, but it's a lot more disordered. A lot of the stuff that's in that chapter is pretty descriptive, and there's not a lot that we can really do with it. So it's, it's, uh, it's useful to look at it, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. What I want to talk about is crystallography as an interaction between a periodic lattice of your molecules in, in the crystal and x-rays. And of course, this happens because we can have uh, constructive and destructive interference between the wave function of the electrons and the incoming x-ray photons. And crystallography is not spectroscopy. We're just looking at x-rays diffracting off the wave function of the electrons. But it's related to a lot of the other stuff we're doing because it involves these ideas of symmetry. So, so instead of point groups, when we start talking about crystal lattices, we need to assign things to space groups. And anybody who's uh, in a crystallography lab or has solved a crystal structure of an organic molecule has seen some of these things. It's kind of the next level of symmetry arguments that we're talking about. And the periodic structure of the crystal is what enables it to diffract x-rays. So how many of you have been involved in solving a crystal structure in some, in some way, either in research or in labs? OK, so a few. But uh, how about crystallizing stuff in organic chemistry lab to purify it? Has everybody seen some of that? OK. Yeah, so we're able to get. Uh, so cr crystallizing your, your compound is a good purification method because you make this really regular lattice where molecules that are the wrong shape don't fit in there. And then we end up with this periodic function that can actually just diffract x-rays. And so that happens because electrons have some wave character. They can interact constructively and destructively with the, uh, the photons. And so you get something that looks like this. So we shoot the x-ray beam at your crystallized molecule. And you know the crystal in this illustration looks pretty messy. But uh, you know, in, in general, you need a very nice crystal in order to get diffraction. And then the x-rays that get scattered off the, the molecule are then detected. And you get a regular pattern of spots that has something to do with the crystal lattice. 
In fact, it gives you the, the inverse of the, the dimensions of the, of the crystal lattice in an indirect kind of way. And then that enables you to get uh, an idea of what the, the unit cell looks like for a molecule. So here's one from uh, a crystal structure of rhodopsin. So we talked about rhodopsin when, when we were uh, talking about how our eyes work and how we have to be careful about uh, calibrating our, our instruments. So we understand rhodopsin because uh, it's been crystallized. There have also been a bunch of NMR structures of different kinds of rhodopsin. But so here's what the unit cell of this looks like. And again, if you want to uh, review what unit cells of crystals look like, go check out, I think it's chapter nine. There are a bunch of simple examples in here. This is a complicated one, but, but it, uh, it obeys the same principles. So here, A, B, and C are the dimensions of the, of the unit cell. So that's our repeating unit. So this is the origin here. We're looking down the A axis, and then B and C are shown here. <clears throat> here are just some examples of diffraction patterns that can be used to solve molecular structures. So this is the original fiber diffraction pattern of the DNA double helix. My DNA picture didn't show up here, but hopefully everybody knows what it looks like. So <clears throat> we see these regular repeating units in the case of the DNA. We've got patterns here and then reflections here that's, that's reflecting the repeating pattern of the DNA. Of course, we don't, <clears throat> in that case, it's a fiber, so it's, it's only crystalline in one dimension. Whereas if we have a three-dimensional crystal, we see these really regular patterns of spots, which we can then analyze and use to get the molecular structure. And I'm going to quit there for today because we're out of time, but next time we're going to talk about this mysterious process by which that happens. See you on Friday.